a space, and that space also has a certain periodicity. So for example, in the case of silicon semiconductors, you have a phase center cubic structure, and then in momentum, you have a body center cubic. Um, so the idea is that that momentum variable is going to work as the velocity variable in Boltzmann problems. And so we're going to work with a system that is uh, very well known by engineers, electrical engineers, and also the Boltzmann community, which is the Boltzmann Poisson system, which is a I mean, classical model for electron transport. And so you work in this phase space of position and momentum. The momentum is related to the crystal momentum, which is h bar k. Um, then what you have is kind of like this semi-classical description of the electron transport in which you have, well, the velocity, and then you have the force, which in this case we're going to restrict it to be an electric field force. Um, and, well, you have a certain Hamiltonian structure coming from these uh, Newton laws um, with given properties. But the important part is that, well, the velocity that you work on in this case is not exactly k, but the group velocity, which comes from the quantum mechanic posing of the problem in some sense. So you have like this wave uh, problem in Schrodinger equation, and these are kind of the eigenvalues, and this gradient of the energy band structure is going to work as your velocity model. And so it's kind of a transport around kind of graph. So there's stuff you know uh, from Boltzmann. I'm not going to talk about that. And well, the Boltzmann Poisson system that we work on is described here. So you have a Boltzmann equation in which the transport in the phase space, position and momentum. This is the velocity, which is like the group velocity from quantum mechanics. Then you have the electric field force. Uh, then you have the collision. So there's a balance between transport and collisions. And well, the collision operator, formally speaking, um, well, it uh, includes Pauli principle. So you have the probability of uh, being and the probability of not being in the other state. Um, later on, you'll see that this is going to become simpler and this collision operator is going to be linearized. And you have a scatterings which consider basically the jumps in energy um, coming from, well, the transition in energy obeying Planck's law. Um, so that is Poiss uh, Boltzmann. For Poisson, um, what you're going to do, well, you're going to have the electric field, uh, which is related to the charge density. So it's not uh, an imposed or given force. So it has to do also with the distribution of charges in the domain. And so that's one of the complications of this Boltzmann Poisson problem. And then you're going to have the electric field, which is uh, the negative of the gradient of the potential. So you may have seen this model before. Um, as in any Boltzmann problem, what you have some the are the microscopic quantities, which are the moments like electron density, um, average velocity, average momentum, and well, energy density, which slight variations due to the problem. And um, well, in Boltzmann, for semiconductors, there is a mass conservation property. But um, well, momentum and energy conservation do not hold in general unless your collision operator has certain properties. So for example, um, energy conservation holds only if your collision operator is elastic. So just to mention. Then, uh, well, um, the list is extensive. There are probably more works, but I tried to make like a synthesis of the previous work and Boltzmann Poisson. Um, the problem of electron transport is very well understood uh, in the electrical engineer community. However, the way they treat it, or is historically, has been by Monte Carlo methods. So, um, well, basically, they try to solve the Boltzmann Poisson with the Monte Carlo. They include the scattering, so they can be as complicated as they want. And so, well, uh, that makes it very simpler. But the problem is that Monte Carlo is going to have always a statistical noise related to the square root of n. And so that's where we, the Boltzmann community, come because we want to provide a method that, well, maybe it's a little bit more costly, but also gives you, well, the moments and the current and the physical observables without that uh, statistical error. So, well, there is uh, also history in terms of the Boltzmann Poisson problem in Boltzmann community. Uh, okay, so it has no statistical noise, it re uh, resolves the transients and it gives you the kinetic moments clearly or cleanly. Um, well, kind of like, it's usually historical based on parabolic and Heimbein models. Um, one of the first works was uh, by Fatemi and Ode, on up with finite difference. Then there also came the work of Majorana and Pidatela. And then there were Wino schemes that were developed by Carrillo, uh, Gamba, Majorana, and Shu. Uh, there is also a very strong uh, group of people in Vienna that works on this topic. Well, historically, Markovich, Ringhofer, and Schmeisser. And they work with the spherical harmonic expansion. Um, and well, the, w well, the um, project that we work on is in this continuous galeric There was a paper by Cheng, Gamba, Majorana, and Shu 
in which they use DG for two different devices. Um, and so, just as a comment, well, the features of this continuous gallery key apply to Boltzmann Poisson is that DG, I'm going to call it DG, is an numerical method that is very adequate for the physics of electron transport. It's a method that incorporates the transport very clearly in the numerics. And well, the way the collision operator is handled is, at least for the simpler cases of energies, is that you have an analytical treatment of the Dirac delta in the collision operator, which I'm going to talk in a second. So as in any Boltzmann problem, the challenge is that the problem is high dimensional, um, and the computational cost, the bigger one, is going to come from collision terms. Um, OK, so some of you may be familiar with discontinuous Galerikin. If you're not, I'm going to try to give a brief summary of how it works. So it's a finite element method. So you're going to expect that what you're going to do is that you're going to multiply by a test function and integrate by parts. So it's the simplest equation that I can um, show. Can you see something or not? Yeah, OK. So you have the transport equation ut plus ux equal to 0. Maybe you can see all the algebra, but basically the step is that you multiply by a test function. You integrate over a given domain. You integrate by parts, so you pass the spatial derivatives to the other test function. And then you're going to have boundary integrals coming from this uh, uh, integration by parts because you're going to allow your basis functions to be discontinuous across the domain. And so there's the question of, okay, what is the value of the function in these boundary values? Because my functions can be discontinuous. So the idea, and this is where the physics of the transport is incorporated in DG, as it was uh, formulated originally for transport problems, is that, okay, you have, for example, a wave propagating on this side. So the idea is that the information is going to transport from this cell to this cell, and therefore the value at this boundary is going to be the value of this cell, because the information is propagating from this side to this side. So uh, in essence, at least for the DG method, uh, as it was first formulated, that is kind of the idea. So this is usually called numerical flux. In this case, what I'm describing is the upwind flux. Um, there are different kind of fluxes, so that is like DG theory. Um, and so, well, you solve that part. Then you have like the time part, which we're going to solve by, say, a room hekuta or a given method. But the idea is that you apply a method of lines and you get a system of ODEs. Um, and then you have to solve this ODE system by room hekuta or something else. Um, uh, some a brief uh, mention about DG. Why is it convenient for a problem, right? So it's very clear from the numerical method that it, uh, well, it describes very well the transport. So it's very adequate for describing the electron transport problem. Um, these are some details about DG. The basis functions are discontinuous, so you can use like a meshing, well, different polynomials on one hand, also the different size of the mesh. Um, well, yeah, you can have polynomials of different degrees. And the idea is that it's a complex scheme. Um, the transport process is like very local in the communication of, communication of the cells. So in principle, it is parallelizable. So that's another convenience. Um, OK, so the way we work on, on our Boltzmann Poisson problem for a project is that we give a spherical coordinate description to the momentum. There are many reasons for this, um, at least, well, I can describe a few. One of them is, for example, that you might have like in a diode problem, a guiding electric field. And so the transport is in y in direction, which relates to also transporting k. And so for example, this cosine of the polar angle uh, relates to, the di to that direction. The other is that the energies are usually related to the norm of the momentum. And so that is another consideration that might be important in terms of the collision operator. So uh, well, in any case, you have a spherical coordinates for the momentum. Then what you're going to do is that you're going to work in this spherical coordinate space, and you want to find a probability density function that works in this spherical coordinate space. So what you do in principle is that you multiply your Boltzmann equation by the Jacobian of this transformation, and you get a PDF in the new space, or well, you get your Boltzmann equation in the new space. Um, and then, well, there are some transformations. Um, this actually is very well described in a paper by uh, well, Cheng, uh, Gamba, Majorana, et cetera. So, well, what you'll have here is like just the group velocity of the electron in a spherical coordinates. Here, the terms might be uh, a little bit more complicated, but the idea is that it's just the description of the transport of the electric field in this new spherical space. So that's just the idea, um, because you have like the products of the electric field with the uh, direction cosines. Um, 
Well, in any case, you have an, a Boltzmann equation for, for your PDF uh, in, the in the space. Then you have your collision operator. So, okay, it's uh, the Jacobian uh, times the old collision operator. And this is what I was talking before. Um, so you have the scattering in which there is a transition in energy. So this is usually called optical electron phonon scattering, which is like a jump in energy. This is acoustic, in which the energy remains the same before and after the interaction. And then you have your Poisson equation in the new variables. And this is a little bit related to what I was talking about. You're going to have a density in which now, well, it is the integral of the new variable phi, which is the uh, PDF with the new Jacobian. And so this is kind of like um, a way to indicate why this phi, as the function that we're going to focus now, is the PDF in the spherical coordinate space. Um, so the description of the method that was used by Chen Gamba, Mayon, and Shu, and that we're going to also use um, for the algorithm, um, it's basically a runge um, kuta discontinuous Galerkin algorithm, um, kind of like the same as uh, Cockburn and Shu, but incorporating the stuff related to Boltzmann Poisson. So you have to compute the charge density because you need to figure out the electric field. The electric field depends on the charges and that the charges also change their position in time. So you compute the charge density and then once you have the density, you solve the Poisson equation to get the electric field. And so you have the transport terms now. Once you have all the transport terms, what you're going to do is to apply this continuous Galerkin to solve like the, the spatial part, like the phase space part. And then you have like a method of lines and the only part remaining is the time part which we're going to uh, solve by Runge Kuta. So this is just a Runge Kuta discontinuous Galerkin scheme. If you are familiar with it, you, um, you will recognize that. Well, so uh, a little bit in the details of the numerical implementation. Um, well, you have these grid cells uh, and grid points. <coughs> so this is the domain in the spatial part, the domain in the angular and spherical part. We're going to use piecewise linear functions. Um, and then, well, the phi, which is actually our new known, the one that we're focusing on, in a given cell is given by this piecewise linear uh, basis function multiplied by the coefficients. You can recover the density from that. Um, and well, basically, because you're working with DG, you have your discontinuous uh, set of basis functions. Um, and so, well, this is the representation in each one of the cells. Again, so this is DG, um, now in the problem that we're working on. So the formulation of DG uh, for our problem is, okay, you have your integral over the domain, your phase space domain, then you multiply by a test function, you integrate by parts on the spatial part, meaning like the position and the momentum, and now in the spherical coordinates, then you're going to have, well, um, boundary integrals um, coming from that integration by parts, and then you're going to have the integral of the collision operator multiplied by the test function. Um, so the boundary integrals are basically related to the numerical flux because you have the value of the boundary. So again, there's a discontinuity, how you're going to decide what is the value of the function. What you're going to do is, in this case, we're going to apply the simplest uh, numerical flux rule, which is the upwind rule, which was the same one I was describing before. So you have like a domain, um, a boundary, and then there's a way propagating from one cell to the other. You choose the value of the cell where the information is propagating to the other. Um, so Poisson equation, uh, it depends in which dimensionality you are. In 1D is very easy. You have an integral formulation. In 2D, you can use a local discontinuous Galerkin. That is your choice for Poisson. And then you have Runge Kuta. Um, <coughs> so for 1D is very easy. This is in the paper of Majorana and Pidatela. So it's uh, just solving the Poisson equation in 1D, which is uh, like a second derivative. Mm -hmm. And you can have the formulations. Uh, for problems like a diode, this is the way we solve it. Like just numerically, we compute these integrals and we get the potential and we get the electric field component. For 2D, this is local DG. I will describe later on, um, not right now. Well, so mm, well in the energy or this uh, energy band structure, uh, it usually does not depend only on the norm of the momentum. So you have a description in which you also have to consider the polar angle and the azimuthal angle. And so what we're ultimately kind of the goal of this project is going to try to apply, well, an energy band function in which you consider the anisotropy and therefore you have to consider a piecewise linear representation of the energy in the domain 
in which you consider, <coughs> sorry, like the norm of the momentum, then the uh, polar angle and the azimuthal angle. So, okay, mm, this is kind of like the introduction. So the description of the project, essentially it's a little bit of what I was telling before. Um, <coughs> we want to describe, well, a physically accurate model in which we consider the anisotropy of the energy band. And so as a first step to consider that anisotropy, what we're gonna use is a numerical um, input of the energy band given by a code that is called empirical so the potential that was worked by Chelikowski. And as this first step, what we're going to do is to work with a radial average of this energy band in order to have kind of like a midpoint between like an isotropic band model and well also a model that is isotropic but that is considering the information of the energy band by means of the spherical averages that you are doing. Um, so in 1D, like a problem like a diode, which is uh, 1D in X, you, if you do certain symmetry assumptions related to the energy band and also with the initial condition, you can ha reduce the dimension to 2D in K, so you have a 3D problem plus time. The Boltzmann equation for this uh, simplified model looks like this. Um, there is a transport related to <coughs> the velocity of the electron. This is a transport related to the electric field. The Poisson equation is the, the very simple 1D that I was talking about. And uh, the particular case that we work with this uh, simplified model is a 1D diode, which is very famous in the Boltzmann community. It's called M plus and M plus because there is like three regions. Um, well, two of them of higher doping in the extremes and the middle one has a lower doping. Uh, the parameters are described here if you're interested. And the length of the channel with the smaller doping is of 400 nanometers in this case. Um, also, because we have a certain asymmetrical symmetry, okay, we can just keep uh, this variable r, which is the square root of the momentum, and this mu, which is the, the polar angle. So that's because of the um, symmetry assumption. Uh, the problem that we are going to work on, just keep this in mind, uh, has an initial condition that is a Maxwellian, multiplied by the doping, and then this constant is such that you have a, well, basically you have the charge l related to the de um, density of the electrons uh, plus the one of the doping equal to zero. So there's a neutrality of charge at the initial time. Um, the boundary conditions that we're going to use in the position, okay, in X space, we use the charge neutrality conditions, which are very common. This is intended just in order, well, if you see this condition, F at the ghost cell is the doping times F at the first cell divided by the density of the first cell. And this is just with the idea that if you integrate, you have the density in the ghost cell equal to the one uh, of the doping one. So you also have like this kind of charge neutrality condition, but in the boundary. Um, this same charge neutrality is done in the last cell. And then you have the applied potential, which is a given differential potential that you put between the endpoints. Um, then you have, what's the time? Okay. Uh, well, you impose a cutoff boundary. So at one value of R max, you say, okay, my phi is zero because far away from the, the origin, like there is no probability or I make it numerically zero. Um, that's the only boundary condition that you need to do because at singular points that become boundaries when you do the spherical transformation, uh, analytically the transport is zero. And we use a runge tattoo. So at this point I have described the Boltzmann problem and the initial condition. Um, what I want to briefly describe now is the empirical pseudo potential method that provides us with the energy bands and energy values that uh, we use for our model. So this is a little bit related to the work by Chelikowski. What you have, what you want is the energy values because that gives you the velocity model that you use for the electron. So essentially the velocity is, uh, of the electron is the group velocity from the quantum mechanical wave. So you have Schrodinger equation. Then what you do, for example, let me go, okay, like this. Well, no, maybe. <coughs> so you post it in Fourier space and then you have Schrodinger equation in Fourier space and in that way, the code of Chelikowski works, providing you with the eigenvalues of Schrodinger equation for the related material that you have, for example, silicon. Um, so the energy eigenvalues of Schrodinger equation is the energy that we work on in Boltzmann, and the energy band structure is just the dispersion in relation uh, of the energy dependent on momentum, which is equal to W of K um, that you have um, in Schrodinger. So the way um, the Chelikowski EPM method works, uh, Chelikowski and Cohen. Well, so you have a lattice potential of the atoms. So you're going to assume that uh, atom potential is symmetric and isotropic. So you have a Fourier series that is truncated. And then with this truncated Fourier series, you solve the determinant for the energy bands. 
and basically he has his code in which he solves the determinant with a truncated Fourier series and he gets at the output the eigenvalues. So what is very common in electrical engineer is that you have, for example, the brilliant zone, which is kind of like the domain, the natural domain for your material in the momentum space. And what they do is that they usually take piecewise linear trajectories in three different directions and they map the energy bands across these three piecewise linear trajectories. So that's very standard from electrical engineer. However, it's a simplified picture of the dependence on the energy in the momentum space because you want to see how the energy behaves in the whole domain. So what I did um, is to play a little bit with Chelikowski's code and well, I used the code that he had to try to make this representation of the energy bands in this domain. And it's a little bit, you can see that across um, point 85 or something, which people from the semiconductor community know very well, you have the local minimum for the conduction band across these areas. And you can see the figure of the ellipsoids that when you go far away from this local conduction band minimum, they stop becoming ellipsoids. And but you have, well, uh, basically a computational representation of the energy conduction band in your momentum. Um, okay, so let me go back. Okay, so this is just to say we have a numerical input for our energy uh, model um, for the bands. So um, again, this is just the group velocity uh, of the quantum mechanical wave. Um, traditionally, in the Boltzmann community, people work with two analytical models, which is the parabolic band model, which is a second order approximation. You can have, a, well, in principle, three different masses related to the direction. Uh, sometimes it is taken as an effective mass. You take just the same parameter of mass for each of the directions, and that's what is called effective mass. Um, <coughs> and, well, there's also this called non parabolic model, which is the Kane model, and which is kind of like a first order perturbation of the parabolic model. And usually it's also taken as a tropic. It has a certain validity. So um, it is mentioned that it's valid up to one or two electron volts. So the idea of the project was to compare. Well, basically what I'm going to do is that I'm going to do a spherical average. So I take as the origin of the momentum this local minimum. I'm going to take spheres around this minimum, local minimum of the, of the energy. And OK, that value that is the average energy over spherical spheres is going to become uh, well, my model, my band model, that tries to incorporate the anisotropy of the energy bands through the average, although it is isotropic itself. Um, and so what I do here is I plot a comparison between, well, so this is a plot of the energy versus k squared, uh, so then the momentum squared. So for a parabolic band model, because it energy is equal to k squared, you get a line. So this is the k band model, which is the, um, well, this first order perturbation, and this is the spherical average of the empirical pseudo potential method. So, well, we have this difference in the values. And this is a plot of the relative error of this average uh, with respect to the full energy band itself. So basically what this is computing, this is the L2 error of the energy minus the average. And so you can see that as you go far away from the origin, the error increases naturally, which is what you expect. Okay, so this is the results of the simulation given the initial condition that I was telling you about. Um, oh, sorry about that. So just remember, you have the initial condition, the Maxwellian, then you have a difference on potential, you have charge neutrality in the diode, and you have these three regions. So initially, you make your density, so this is the status of uh, the variables at, time, at the initial time. Sorry. So the density, okay, it has this profile, it has a given constant density here, then it goes very low, it's not zero, it's just like a difference in order of magnitude, and then it goes back again up. So that is because you make the density equal to, or yeah, equal to the doping initial time. The average velocity is zero. The average energy at the beginning, this is just a residual. Basically, they have like kind of like the same value. But uh, in red, you have the spherical EPM average. In green, you have the Kane band model. And in blue, you have the parabolic. This is just a residual because they ha are different Maxwellian. So when you compute the, the average energy, that's why you get this small difference. But it's negligible. You'll see later. Uh, so you have the electric field, which is a constant field. Then you have the difference of potential. So in this case, I use 0.3 volts. And the momentum at the initial time is zero. Um, so, uh, well, this is the simulation at the time of five picoseconds, which is kind of like our final time uh, for a potential of 0.3 volts. So the density hasn't changed that much. It has stabilized a little bit. Then if you uh, look at the average velocity, well, you can see that there's a difference in the prediction uh, for each of the different three band models. So for parabolic, well, it seems that uh, it overestimates the value of the average velocity. 
Kn is below, the spherical average is below. And likewise for the energy. That, that kind of makes sense because if you remember the plot, um, well, there's an overestimation in the energy values for the parabolic, then the Kn, and then so the energy. So you expect that in principle, you will get the higher energy for the parabolic than the other one for the Kn, and then the one for the spherical average. The electric field and the potential do not change very much. Um, and then when you basically plot the predictions of the momentum, which is the current in your device, well, you also have like a difference between the parabolic, the Kn, and the spherical average. So what I keep at this point, uh, well, so this is a picture of the, moment of the current um, versus time. So you see how the current stabilizes over time. Uh, at five picoseconds, it's a constant current. This is just a picture of the PDF at the junctures, where there is a change of the m plus to the n region at point three and point seven in your domain. And what I uh, show here is just a comparison for the simulations for the same potential at point three volts with a channel, say, of 400 nanometers and then a channel of 50 nanometers. So because the, cha the channel is going to be smaller and you have the same difference of potential, you're going to have a higher electric field. Uh, so yeah, the electric field is higher in some sense. Um, what you can see also is that both the electric field and the potential do not change very much according to the band model that you use. Uh, well, when you compute the um, prediction of the momentum, wi well, which is the velocity moment, sorry, you see again that you have like this difference in the quantitative behavior of the parabolic, Kane, and the EPM average for the 400, which is in the left, and the 50 nanometer, which is in the right. Uh, also, the average energy. Um, <coughs> there's a quantitative jump. Um, and well, the momentum, which is the prediction of the current, is also different according to which band model you use. So, well, so this is the first part of the project. Uh, how much time do I have, sorry? Um, okay, yeah, that's okay. So, okay, for this part of the project, uh, you use this spherical average of the empirical to the potential method as a mean point between the radial and the full band. Um, so what you see is that there is a difference in the quantitative predictions for the moment, particularly in average velocity, average energy, and average momentum, which is the current. So, okay, this is just a start. The idea eventually is try to use an energy band, uh, basically the numerical representation of Chelikovsky, right? In which you have the anisotropy and you have like this dependence on the energy and the three uh, directions of the momentum. And what you want to do is, uh, well, have a piecewise linear representation of the energy in the cells, which you have, okay, this description of the average value, then, um, and the piecewise linear dependence on each of the three variables of the momentum. So this is just like a study of, see, of seeing like, okay, is the implementation of the empirical pseudo potential or a different band model going to be important in terms of the output of the current? Apparently it is. And so that gives us hope that we are going to have a better physical description of the Boltzmann Poisson problem for electrons if we include an anisotropic band model. Uh, so that is the first project. Uh, the second one is a uh, work in progress, it's not done. So actually, if you want to talk to me after uh, the presentation, I will be more than happy to discuss. <coughs> so the second project is related to reflection boundary conditions uh, on Boltzmann Poisson. Um, well, so the starting point, at least for me, because I work in this project, is uh, the work by Chen Gam, Mayana, and Shu, in which they uh, basically use a Kane energy coordinate. I'll tell you in a second what that is. And they study two devices, a silicon diode and then a double gate MOSFET. So this is a picture of the double gate MOSFET. It is a device in which you have something called the source, the drain, and the gate. And so basically what you have here is like a given potentials imposed in the source, the drain, and the gate. Um, and then like in this region, uh, there is like a, some isolation. And what you're going to have basically are some specular boundary conditions, and you apply the potential here. So, okay, they studied that device. Um, naturally, the reflection conditions that they use in this insulating part were specular because that's what everybody does in um, Boltzmann Poisson for electrons, not the Boltzmann. I mean, Boltzmann is very well studied for uh, another kinds of reflections for other problems. And so the idea is, uh, as our well, this is the, our work in progress, is to try to study diffusive and mid reflection uh, in Boltzmann Poisson problems for electrons. So this is uh, just a list that is non-exhaustive uh, related to people that works on basically specular diffusive and mixed reflection. It's not complete. I was not aiming for it to be complete. I'm just trying to mention that it appears on different applications. And so, well, in kinetic theory of gases, it's very well studied. Uh, you can see the book by Cherchignani. Also, you can see the book at Sonnet. 
Uh, well, there is uh, recently this paper by Bruel, Chaguet, and Musson, in which uh, they study, they do a mathematical analysis of the uh, diffusive reflection and also consider nanoscales and the van der Waals force, if I remember. And they also mentioned like this uh, Russian, which has some other applications. Um, well, there is also a reference uh, for electrical conduction in which they study like this surface roughness. Because ultimately, the idea of studying this kind of reflection boundary condition is that you might have roughness on a surface of your material. And so the reflection is not going to be specularly exact. So that's the, mo the physical motivation in terms of why we're studying this boundary condition. Um, so, well, he does it not for semiconductors, but for metals. And he has a model in which, uh, well, he has a specularity probability which depends on the momentum. And semiconductors, there is several people who has worked on that. Well, um, there you can see the book of Michael Hofer and Smyser, which they describe the info boundary conditions. There's also a paper by Cherchiniani, Gamba, Lembermore, in which uh, they study basically half field approximations to Boltzmann Poisson and boundary conditions for different moments. And well, in the Jungel book of um, transport equations for semiconductors, the uh, uh, conditions of specular diffusive and mix are mentioned, although um, it's not that they elaborate on that. Um, so the way um, uh, we are going to understand the problem of reflection boundary conditions in our, in our problem. OK, so you have basically um, Neumann inflow and outflow boundaries, um, which are described here, right? So it is what is incoming and outgoing. And the idea is that you're going to impose the values of the PDF in the inflow Neumann boundaries as a, well, they're going to be provided by a function of the outflow values. So for a specular reflection, for example, which is just it bounces back, uh, what you want to do is to relate the value of f in the inflow Neumann boundary to the value of f in the outflow Neumann. And well, if you see this xk belongs to gamma minus, I'm going to use that notation, and it's related to the value of xk prime, and k prime is just the reflected k. Like, okay, you see like how it bounces back, and that is the relation between the two f's. And so this is described here. This is just a reflection. For diffusive reflection, okay, you have the value at um, the Neumann gamma uh, info boundary. It's going to be, well, this Maxwellian multiplied by this um, integral. So this integral, okay, has as its uh, probability the f in the gamma plus values, the outflow values. <coughs> Sorry. And, well, here you have the average, well, the velocity in the normal component. And c is going to be a parameter which is going to satisfy uh, basically a zero flux condition, uh, which I'm going to tell you in a second. This is going to be important, at least for the mixed case. Ooh, um, for the mixed reflection, well, it's just a convex combination of the specular and the diffusive part. You can have, well, the, this p represents the specularity parameter, like how probable is it for you to reflect. And it goes from zero to one, and it can be constant, or it can be, for example, in general, a function of the momentum as the paper from software, right, in which they have a probability depending on the momentum. Um, so, um, okay, as I was telling, um, well, this zero flux condition is just an impenetrability condition. It's probably appearing in more papers related to Boltzmann in different parts, but just as I mentioned for semiconductors, there is this paper by Cherchiniani, Gamma, and Levermore, in which they study um, basically the Neumann boundary, and they mention this zero flux condition in which, if you see, this is the, norm the normal at a given point. This is the current at that given point. And what you want is that, well, you have impenetrability in the sense that, OK, the, there is, uh, the mass cannot go out of the domain. And so it goes back. Um, and so, well, this j is the current, which is the average, uh, well, the velocity times f integrated, as you know. Then what you can do is you divide the, uh, this domain in between the inflow parts and the outflow parts. And here, well, you know the values because it's f at the outflow. Here you have f at the inflow, but you're going to impose a boundary condition, right? Because you had the values of the inflow as functions, as a function of the outflow. So you just plug it in. I, at this point, I'm just writing the condition. It doesn't matter. And for simplicity, I'm going to call b this group velocity of the electron. Um, so, uh, well, for specular, it's very well known. I mean, for people who studied physics, I was a physicist. So it's very clear that if you have a specular condition, you're going to have like this reflux condition, because that's the whole idea. Um, formally speaking, well, uh, what you can do is, OK, you can plug in in this condition uh, what you were saying before. So the value of the f, so you divide the inflow part, the, uh, the, inflow part, the outflow part. Uh, then you have like this minus, because you have this condition. And here you have the same, because of your condition that f at k is equal to fk prime, and then you have 0. That, that is very easy. 
Um, for diffusive, uh, well, if you remember this constant, uh, see, I didn't mention too much about it, but the idea is that this constant is such that the zero flux condition is satisfied. Um, and so you see, okay, you have, for your diffusive reflection, you have your Maxwellian, you have your um, average of your velocity, and then the C, if you plug it in, you get the, well, the constant that everybody knows. So you plug this value or this uh, F um, gamma minus in the integral, then you have the, this same integral here, and then you'll see that you can derive this C. Um, is this clear? Is there any question at this point? Am I being clear? Okay. So, well, basically you get the C from this condition of uh, zero flux. For the mixed reflection, for the constant case, I guess you can expect the result. I mean, the uh, specularity parameter and the diffusivity one is constant. So just by convexity, this is going to be zero. If the two cases were zero, that's going to happen. So, I mean, this is just playing. I mean, this is very well known. Um, I'm not saying anything new up to this point. I just want to mm, formulate the problem in a way that is related to the inflow and outflow. So, well, you can get that the, uh, well, eta dot, dot j is zero, just by um, convex combination. Here, um, this is a little bit that if you, well, it's a work in progress, so if you want to talk with me, I'll be more than happy. Um, and yeah, if you, well, so basically for P of K, the constant uh, that we derived before might not work um, because essentially it comes from the zero flux condition. So what I want is to kind of like formally get the C uh, from this impenetrability condition. So, well, basically the situation is a little bit more complicated because the P's in this case are not constant, so they cannot come out of the integral as easily. Uh, so that's why you may have to be a little bit more careful. And so here, what I do is I plug in, okay, so I divide in, okay, so this is the integral, B dot theta, I divide in uh, the outflow and the inflow part, here I impose my boundary condition, here I'll get the integrals, here the P cannot go out as before, here I have the factor one minus P, C can go out because it does not depend on K. Uh, and what you'll get is a little bit of a cumbersome condition to be honest, um, I'll skip the detail, but well, essentially you get this kind of condition. And I come from the computational point of view. It's the, for me, it's just that I want a code that kind of like conserves the mass and satisfies physically this non-penetrability or zero flux condition. So the idea for me is that this condition is com more complicated and I don't like it because it depends on F. And so if it depends on F, it varies at each time. And I don't want it because I have to compute the constant every time. And it seems like it's as costly as uh, when I would uh, compute the integral for the diffusive condition. So I mean, I'm not saying this is a good C. Uh, I'm saying precisely the opposite. What I'm saying is like, hey, you have this C sigma. Uh, if you look at this, well, you have the C, which is the sigma, and then divided by these two. So if you remember the diffusive part, you'll have the C sigma in the product. And this is the part that I care about. And if I look about this formula, I see that I have a part, okay, that depends on F, and a part that depends just on a Maxwellian. And that is very similar to wha what I had before in the diffusive reflection for the, or the mixed reflection with the constant case. So what I'm going to do is that I'm going to formulate the mixed reflection in terms of these C primes and sigma primes in order to get, well, so I redefine the sigma prime as this. It's very similar to the sigma. It just has like this factor one minus P of K prime. And this C prime, which also has this factor one minus P of K, um, and well, it's related to Maxwellian. So it does not depend on F anymore. It's just a, uh, constant that depends on the position of the normal um, and that's just with the idea of having like this conservation of mass from the computational point of view and having a way that it's very easy to compute the C. That's my whole point. Um, not anymore. Um, if you want to talk about it uh, later after the talk, I'll be more than happy to talk. Uh, so uh, in the work of uh, Chen Gamma Marion and Shu, they were using the Kane band. Um, basically, well, the main idea is that you have the dependence on the energy just on the norm of K. You have this first order correction. And you can use the energy as a coordinate because there's a monotonic relation between the norm of the momentum and the energy. So it's just kind of like the same story after that. Uh, you'll have a PDF uh, with the F multiplied by the Jacobian. Um, you'll have your transport equation with this new PDF when you multiply the Jacobian uh, to the equation. Then you have your collision terms. You have the jump of energies. You have the Poisson equation. 
Uh, again, you have a piecewise linear approximation, and again, the DG is just a multiply integrated by parts in this uh, five dimensional space in this case, and you have boundary integrals which are the numerical flux. Um, this is the part that is a little bit different. For 2D, you have to solve Poisson. Oh, uh, five minutes? Okay. Oh, two. Okay, sorry. So I'll just go quickly for a DG, local DG. What you do is to basically reformulate uh, Poisson equation into three equations, and then you have a this local discontinuous Galerkin method in which you multiply by test functions and basically is trying to solve uh, this elliptic problem by means of DG. If you, you can check references, there are plenty. Um, so, well, the idea is, um, well, okay, you have this numerical implementation of the specular reflection, then you have the diffusive. I'll just go over the details of the, diffusi of the diffusive, which is, well, you take this integral over the outflow boundary, then you have the phi, then uh, once you have the phi and you have this uh, formulation of the velocity component in the spherical coordinate space or the Cain coordinate space, you have this sigma and then once you have this sigma, okay, you have the sigma multiplied by the Maxwellian times the Jacobian because that's the diffusive condition, but this does not belong to the space of the piecewise linear function, so you have to do a projection in order to get the piecewise linear polynomial that you want. Um, so, well, for diffusive, this is just the details of the computation. For the mix, it's just going to be a convex combination for the constant case of the specular coefficients and the diffusive ones. Uh, for, well, this is work in progress. I haven't uh, finished implementing like the mix reflection with uh, uh, P parameter depending on K, but the idea is very similar to the diffusive case because now I have this one minus P factor. I integrate the using the phi that is in the inside cell. I get the sigma. Once I get the sigma, I have this phi, which mixes the specular and the diffusive with a non-constant, and I would have to project. So at least in terms of like the numerical part, I'm formulating what I need to do. And I have this sigma prime and C prime that are very analogous to the sigma and C. And so computationally, it's doable. That's all I'm saying. Um, okay, so I have simulations with silicon. Again, I use a Maxwellian. I do bulk silicon at this point because we're in work in progress. Um, so basically, I have bulk silicon, I have a Maxwellian, I have just a difference of potential between the source and the drain, and then that's in the X boundaries. In the Y boundaries, what I have is just uh, the reflective boundary condition that I choose, either the specular, diffusive, or mixed. Um, so that's the whole idea. And well, these are some preliminary simulations. The mixed uh, reflection that I show here is just with a constant parameter. So I have the specular, diffusive, and mixed, the density. So you see that for a specular, it's just uh, like this flat thing that you would expect uh, because it's a very simple problem. You see a deformation of the density. Then you see an overestimation of the momentum, uh, the X momentum uh, for the diffusive and mixed cases. So it's the velocity. For the energy, the um, diffusivity basically drops the energy. The um, prediction for the potential is the same for three cases, perhaps to because of the numerical method that we use, which is local DG. The electric field is basically the same. I mean, the difference is just very small. It's just a slight difference in the X component. And so, well, this is just what I have said in a second. Um, the work in progress is the mixed reflection um, with the P of K parameter, and also apply these conditions for a double gate MOSFET device. So, uh, well, this is the end, and thank you very much. <laughs>